today we have with us mb parmeshwaran mb is a brand consultant coach and founder of brand-building.com a brand advisory he is a much in demand speaker at corporate industry events and an award winning best selling author of 10 books mb spent his 40 year career in corporate india with boots company udi yellow pages rediffusion advertising and fcb ulka he spent 25 years with fcb ulka building it into one of the india's top 5 ad agencies and over last 5 years he has served on corporate boards as an independent director as a brand coach to several small and large brands and as a mentor to exciting new startups he has worked on iconic brands and companies such as tata with Wipro, Z, TCS, Thermax, Tata Indica, GSK, Tropicana, Amul, Nirma, LIC, Santur, Sundrop, Abbott, ITC, etc. And MB now reads, writes, teaches, and coaches leaders across multiple domains. And he's a guest faculty at I am Calcutta. I am Ahmedabad, MICA, and an adjunct professor of marketing at SPJN IMR. MB's column appear regularly in the Business Standard and several other business publications. He is a distinguished alumnus awardee from both IIT Madras and IIM Calcutta, an AMP graduate from Harvard Business School, a PhD in management from Mumbai University, and a CFI certified CEO coach. He has recently released a book, Spring: Bounce Back Stronger from Every Rejection. and i started reading it and i simply couldn't put it down full of real life stories and some solid advice to handle rejections so thank you mp for joining us on this channel so thank you uh thank you rohan for inviting me to be on your channel and for this interview thank you for your kind words and glad to know that you are enjoying <laughs> reading my latest book spring bouncing back from rejection uh the book is there at the back uh, strategically positioned right so that whenever they see me they can also see spring so anyway thank you thank you for uh for inviting me and i look forward to an engaging session with you and with of course with the audience yeah so this show is basically focused on learning through stories kisse kahaniyon se so real life stories so tell us a little bit about your personal life journey beyond all this professional qualifications and experience well you know i mean uh, i am not a metro i mean i'm i'm from chennai i am not from mumbai or delhi uh, from a pretty conservative south indian background i did have a privileged childhood because fortunately for me my grandfather had come from a village to a to the big city with nothing in his pocket and built his fortune so i got the benefit of that i didn't have to struggle too much uh and uh, had a fairly i would say a privileged background enjoyed my uh, school uh, school life which was in uh, madras you know conservative part of madras called mailapur which is where the famous kabaleshwar temple is located so i studied in a in a school which was a very nice cozy school with just 30 students in each class and uh, the teachers knew every one of us and uh, they even knew our parents we used to go to the same music concerts so my mom knew my class teacher and uh, so it's it's like a uh, you know mailapur <laughs> itself was like a little bit like a village so to speak so everyone knew everyone so i had a very good childhood a lot of i mean we still have a very vibrant a uh, group of our school friends i was not sure what to do you know when you finish school you're not sure what you want to do so my father told me to do first group which is math physics chemistry and he told me that i should go to iit i mean when he told me that i should go to iit i didn't have even have an idea what i knew iit was some kind of engineering college but i had no idea that it was a difficult college to get into so that i discovered later but you know getting into iit itself was not all that difficult we put in some effort uh, five six friends of ours got together and formed a group and we actually all five of us managed to get into iit pretty decent ranks 
and then iit was a, a mind blowing experience because you know you are brought up in a very conservative household uh, we were not even eating you know onions and and garlic in our house and then you go into uh, an ocean called iit where you have class you have you know guys coming from all over india all kinds of background so it was mind blowing so the iit experience uh, rohan and you've been through that so you know you can empathize with it uh, is that it 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 opens up you know you'd have gone through a different experience in iit i went through a different experience everyone thinks they come into iit and then you think uh, you know you're a genius uh, because you managed to crack the iit entrance exam and then you go into a classroom where there are people who are much much better than you and then you kind of you feel belittled almost because these guys you take one hour to understand a problem and this guy has understood it in 10 minutes and solved it in the next 10 minutes so you suddenly realize you know the brilliant kids around you and you get exposed to other things so in iit in at least those days academics was important but there was also a lot of other things we used to do whether it is dramatics theater skits music art very vibrant reading culture beyond textbooks so iit uh, you know the fact that you live together uh, you know every day the whole culture of iit opens up your mind i mean at least those days it was not a very nerdy yes there were what probably 20% of the class was very nerdy and very bookish but the balance 60 70% was pretty open yeah you studied you had a lot of exams a lot of tests so you studied for that you managed to after the first semester you crack the system you know what to do and then you actually develop other things you read you listen to all kinds of music you get exposed to different kind of literature so that was mind expanding iit but at the end of my fourth year i knew i was not a great i will not make a great engineer and that's when you know one decided to uh, change course and go and do an mba fortunately managed to get into a decent uh, i would say probably india's best business school i am calcutta and uh, and then of course my journey continued right so a somewhat a typical background business family uh, getting into engineering i probably the only engineer in my extended family uh, only guy to go and do an mba again from my extended family among all my cousins i think i'm the only guy to have gone and done a masters engineer yeah i have a cousin who's an engineer and another cousin who's a doctor but other than that uh, i think i did pretty well academically so that's the early part of my life uh, ron hmm. so i would like you to describe the soil and roots behind the tree and fruits so what has you know what have been your inner thoughts and narratives and how 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 did you build them up what what were some of the events which shaped you many many small events shape you you know you don't realize that you know i when i was in school in eighth standard or so i was not among the top students in the class but one particular teacher mentioned it to a friend of mine called murli and murli told me the day ambi you know rs sir said you will probably top the class so i i said look yeah murli i am not anywhere near the top yeah there are 30 students there are 10 students who are scoring better than me in every test and every exam i don't know whether i can top the class so he said no this is what he said and uh, so if you put in effort so actually that kind of spurred me on to study harder and do well in academics so that's one the other is i used to score very poorly in english I mean, these are some stories from my childhood which which yeah. you know suddenly you realize right mm. uh, i used to score very poorly in english and i remember we had a teacher called saraswati mm. and uh, she called me aside and she made me sit down and said look uh, parmeshwaran you know you're a bright student but your english is not up to the mark so i said miss you know what should i do so she said you know you're thinking in tamil and writing in english <laughs> i did the same right so mm. how did you fix it ro mm. so i think i uh, for me the fixing was was it happened much later even after my mba where where a, a mentor actually shifted my thought saying that you 
you have to just communicate your your message through instead of the language so, so that actually shifted uh, my case but let's hear what what was your no, you know saraswati miss said look you are thinking in english and writing in you know you are thinking in tamil okay. and you are writing in english which is why your sentences are all convoluted <laughs> no tamil uh, you know you may say that anga poyinda irundha bodu or mara ulundhudu so which means while i was going there a tree fell now while i was going there a tree fell doesn't you know in english doesn't make sense but in tamil makes perfect sense mm. you know anga poyinda irundha bodu or maram ulundhudu in english i say that while i was going there one tree fell uh, it, it doesn't ring ring well at all so she said look you need to get out of this habit and the way to break this habit is write short sentences do make sure that none of your sentences are more than 5 6 words hmm. and that was such a powerful advice yes i started practicing it and you won't believe it rohan within a year i was scoring the highest in english in my class and my english was not great but the okay. fact that i could, i could write pithy sentences and that's some that's a habit i've carried forward if you if you looked at my books in my books mm. i i have a very fast style of writing and the sentences are very short mm. and that's an old habit you know which has, has stayed with me and that was a great tip which i got from my teacher i, I you know she passed away uh, last year and uh, you know i mean it was so great right i mean so wonderful that if a teacher can sit down with you yeah. and that's what all of you all of us try to do as a mentor or as a coach the person sit down point out his mistakes and and, and without telling him it's it's his fault but it's a particular process mistake mm. okay, and tell him that look this is how you can correct it yeah and yet and give give a practical advice which which can change the course of a life probably <laughs> exactly so it's, it's simple advice you know not not complicated not that you know read shakespeare and yeah yeah, yeah. watch movies and <laughs> charles dickens or aldus huxley nothing like that right simple sentences this way you can you will break the the mind thing which is thinking in tamil and writing in english or thinking in hindi and writing in english you mm. break that you want to start writing short sentences and then it then it different now, now i write long sentences i'm not scared of writing long sentences but i've got out of the habit of thinking in tamil and writing in english that was a interesting little uh, story from my childhood mm okay so uh, what has been your core leadership philosophy and core value and from where did you get them built well i i you know i was uh, i was fortunate that i had some uh, wonderful people who were mentors to me you know when mm-hmm. i started my career subhash chakravarti at rediffusion and then ps vishwanathan again at rediffusion ajit balakrishnan at rediffusion arun nanda they were all great great role models and great great mentors to have and one thing i learned from them was the need to keep improving yourself the need to learn new things the need to keep abreast with what is going on and then later i had uh, got a boss called anil kapoor who again was a great mentor who used to believe that nothing is ever done right it's always work in process work is work in process you got to keep keep trying to improve keep trying to improve yourself keep trying to learn so that's been one core philosophy of mine which is you know learning is never over you may be 45 50 60 65 doesn't matter you have to keep learning you have to keep improving yourself and your job as a leader is to help your team fly higher you know help everyone around you to improve their game so that's that's how you succeed and that's that's you know that's what i learned from my uh, past mentors and that's what i've tried to live so i today work with work with companies work with individuals as coaches my whole job is to try and open up their mind <laughs> so they can fly a little higher than what they were flying earlier and which is what you know my mentors have done with me in the in the past one question is that what did you bring forth that you could 
get value from these mentors because these mentors will have a lot of people in their lives, but not maybe everyone would have got impacted that way. So what did you bring forth to the table to allow those that contribution to come to? I think, uh, I think all these mentors were open to feedback. Okay. So it was not as if it was a totally one way street. So you could actually sit and have a serious discussion with them. Okay. And the openness, right? Openness to give feedback, openness to take feedback. And I think that's what they brought. They, I took to the table, right? You have to take something to the table. What is that you take to the table is the fact that you can give feedback. You can be, mm-hmm. you're open to criticism. You could have a serious disagreement saying, look, this is what you want me to do. And I don't agree. And then you have a serious argument at the end. Uh, they may say, yeah, you got a point, go do it your way. Mm-hmm. Or they may say, sorry, I think I am right. Do it this way. And then you quietly do it that way, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, they are the boss and they know better. And and uh, I'm not saying they know better in a derogatory way, but they know better because they have many well, years of experience. They've seen all this, which you don't know. But mm-hmm. there have been cases where I've had a serious disagreement. I said, I'm sorry, you know, this is not going to work. Uh, I want to go this way. And they think about it as okay. If you think it'll work, go ahead and do it, right? And 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 sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. You go back and say, "Sorry, boss, it didn't work." It's okay. I told you, but TK, it's okay. You learn something next time. Don't repeat the same mistake. And I think that's something which one has to allow one's team to do, which is to come back to you with honest feedback, uh, and you should be able to take it. You know, I don't know whether I was as good at taking feedback as my bosses. But I've tried to say, look, this is what I think. And what do you guys think? And then they say, no, we don't agree. I said, okay, then let's do it your way and see what happens. So mm. so, uh, so basically you, you kept having, engaging into a dialogue and speaking your mind as well, rather than just making it a one way street. And, uh, and at, at different point of time, sometime it probably became a one way street, but after a dialogue. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. As a as a good uh, as a good mentor, you have to listen to the other guy, mm-hmm. and if you are a mentee, you have to give feedback because only then will you be able to learn, right? Mm-hmm. So that's been, I mean, that's been my guiding thing that you know, just because you're the boss, boss is not always right, mm-hmm. and the boss should always have an open mind to take feedback on. Mm-hmm. Uh, something which which may be wrong but you know you have to give feedback so what would you call uh, if anything as a turning point in your life in all the journey what was the where did you find a biggest structural shift in your mindset or the way you looked at the world or work was there would be a series of events but anything which stands out i i suppose one of the turning point in my life was joining advertising mm-hmm. i am calcutta as an engineer and an mba joining a relatively unknown agency in 1979 mm. you know it's a little bit you know today thinking back it was it's a huge a risk <laughs> it was a crazy risk to take and <clears throat> you add to that i was a very good student mm. i was what they call and you have been in i am calcutta you know i was an ice call you mm. know i was a top ranker what we call the honor roll student mm. my name is up there on the on the honor roll, the honor board, rolls. Mm. Yeah, between L1 and L2. So, you know, I could have, I'm not saying I would have got the job, but I could have got a job in a top FMCG company. I could have probably even tried for a job in in a bank, in a multinational bank, because I was, you know, like in IM Calcutta, you don't have one major. I was, I'd taken a balance of both finance and uh, marketing. And marketing. Mm. I was pretty good in finance. I think I'm not sure, but I probably topped the, the finance uh, uh, group. Mm. Uh, so I was very good at finance. I was pretty good at marketing. Uh, so I could have even tried. In fact, some of the guys who were applying for Citibank later thanked me. Mm. You cleared one, one seat yeah. for us. <laughs> that bank, yeah, tu, tu nikal gaya, yaar, you know, so we are happy because I, I had, a, I pro, you know, I may not, I might have probably muffed up all those interviews. So let me also clarify. Mm. But that was a big shift. Uh, not getting into marketing, not getting into finance, not getting into a big company, getting into a small company. That was probably uh, the biggest uh, biggest shift, the big turning point. 
the next mm. uh, big turning point probably was joining ulka advertising when a lot of people including alec padamsi who was in the ceo of linta is telling me that you're making a mistake because mm. uh, people thought ulka may not survive uh, because it was going down and uh, anil kapoor had joined and he was trying to rope in a few of us to come in people thought he will not be able to revive the company but you know uh, he is a great leader and he assembled a fabulous a team and we managed to perform what you call a perfect miracle in both cases i want to ask you the question what was going in your head which allowed you to take that risk or daring while while against the popular advice difficult to difficult to think back and and put one thing but you know maybe i had probably foolhardy but i was <clears throat> confident of my skills right? so i knew that let's say redefusion if i join redefusion if it turns out to be a mistake a year later i get taken out of the job mm-hmm. because i knew my subjects you know i i knew i was very very good at what i could do in mm-hmm. my summer assignment a summer internship i had proven that i can work very hard and do things mm-hmm. so i probably was supremely confident that mm-hmm. if it fails i can get something else stuff cut back to when i joined ulka i had said i want to move to chennai because i ne- never l- never worked and lived and worked in chennai so i moved to chennai again i was 100% confident if the if the ulka agency goes south then you know i will go out and get something i had a good track record i had worked in marketing i had worked in sales i had worked in advertising so you know i will i will get something you know i was so i i think you know thinking back you do whether right or wrong when you take those risks uh, you got to have the inner courage to say that look if this goes down you know i'm not going to cry i will find something else to do so um, before we come to the rejection book uh, what would you say would be your biggest failure or setback which you turned around in life there are some in the book itself right so there is this uh, i've written that uh, story about how you know we we were called to make a, a pitch to a car account mm, i remember tata motors 1997 hyundai invited us and ah, yeah, uh, we went and made a presentation and we thought you know we had done a good job but uh, at the end of the presentation i was walking out i knew in my bottom of my heart this was a lousy presentation so mm. i told my colleagues five of us had gone from bombay to chennai for the presentation so i said yeah this is not working you know we don't know what to do and my colleagues said no no i think we did a good job i said sorry we didn't do a good job so mm-hmm. as expected we didn't get the account mm-hmm. and we came back to bombay and i sat with my the md of the company anil kapoor and i said look mm-hmm. we didn't do well so rambi why why do you say so i said look i don't think we know enough about advertising for cars mm-hmm. Uh, we have never really handled a car business, boss, and we need to do more homework. He said, "Okay, so what do you suggest?" I said, "I want to put together a whole team to go deeper into car buyers, understand them, look at international research, and start mapping it. And we will pick something else." So he said, "Okay, start working on it." And you know, as luck would have it, January 1998, Tata Motors had unveiled their new car, and we met them. a month later got them to participate in a case study competition at the end they said look we are going to call for an agency pitch at that time we we didn't know they were calling for an agency pitch but we thought maybe there's a chance they said we're calling so are you ready I said yes we'll be ready so we pitched and we put in a lot of effort i mean uh, some 30 people worked for like for a month and a half we did an amazing amount of work we did research we did campaigns of course we had done we did a lot of work. 15 agencies pitched for that business so 15 or 14 agencies pitched for that business including the biggest and the best agencies in the country and uh, we won the pitch that was a big turning point for the whole and that time the tata motors people had told me that look th- we will be your biggest account and i was you know i was not sure because we had other good account we had hero honda we had i think we had got whirlpool by then we had uh, amul we had bipro we had itc some part of tcs but you know but i said yeah yeah but but it turned out that uh, tata motors was our biggest account from 99 to almost till 
14 or so. And uh, that was a big, big win. And that came out of a failure, right? It came out of rejection. Mm. Uh, fortunately for us, at the end of Hyundai, uh, when it went bad, we didn't sit and blame the client. I mean, we could have easily, you know, done that. This client is very biased. He didn't like us. I think honest introspection always helps. And that was a, a big win. And change the fortune. I mean, that one account win, which happened in 98, changed the fortunes of the company based on the, on the campaign we did for Tata Motors. Mahindra came and uh, the agency set up a second agency called Interface which mm -hmm. continues to handle the Mahindra business. Uh, yeah. It gained the fortunes of the company. I think for 10 years, FCB Ulka Group was riding on the success of Tata Motors. We picked up a lot of other accounts on that and it turned out to be a great win. And it started with a failure. So tell us a bit about your rejection book, Spring, and the rejection book journey and what made you write it? You've written so many books. So why you took this topic and... Um, and while I strongly re recommend the viewers to read the full book, what are some of your recommendations uh, to the viewers? Yeah, so Ron, I think, uh, you know, I'm not a psychology expert. You know, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. And this is my 10th book. And uh, all my books in the past have been about branding, about advertising, about consumer behavior. So I was at this Jagran Lake University, I think October uh, September of 2018, I think. And I gave a talk on my uh, previous book, Sponge Leadership Lessons, which is there. Mm -hmm. the back. Yes, I can see the second one. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So at the end of my talk, there was a nice round of applause. The audience were about 500 or 600 students and faculty. There was one girl who was very keen on asking a question and she was at the back of the auditorium. And you know, in all these things, the mic goes around. So the mic was getting hijacked and finally the mic reached uh, this young girl and she said look sir you seem to have had a very good uh, education very good career you met very good uh, business leaders but you know we are all young people here and we are scared that we'll be rejected so what can you tell us about rejection and it was almost to question me to say look what do you know about rejection because you may have probably never faced rejection in your life so that's when I stopped and I thought for a bit and I gave a extempore uh, talk for about 10 minutes on, on what is rejection and how I faced rejection and how I overcame those rejections. I spoke about how I was, you know, my interviews, you know, the two interview stories I've written about the book, yeah. mm -hmm. how it went and how I learned from that and, and you know, how, how I managed to find redirect my career. And at the end of my 10 minute talk, uh, there was a standing ovation. Uh, my one hour talk on sponge got a nice applause. I didn't have a standing ovation, but this, I don't know, some people suddenly stood up and started clapping and the whole auditorium stood up and started clapping. So I was quite amazed. I realized that maybe, maybe the young people are very worried about rejection and there is something to this, you know, and it got me thinking. And then in November, uh, when I was in IM Calcutta and I was getting the, the Distinguished Alumnus Award in every one who gets the award is allowed to speak for 10 minutes, a kind of an acceptance speech. And I repeated a part of that, ex, you know, part of that rejection speech at IM Cal. And, and Ron, you know, the IM Cal crowd, you know, they don't clap very much for anything, <laughs> uh, except if you are, you know, Steve Jobs or Indra Nui or someone like that. So I was actually quite surprised that they actually gave me a very warm uh, round of applause when they heard my rejection story. And then I said, look, maybe this is, a, this is an interesting topic for me to kind of dig into and I started reading up on the topic and I spoke to my uh, literary agent. He said, yeah, uh, looks interesting. Let me talk. In fact, I had not written anything. Mm -hmm. I just explained the story to him on, you know, like this. He went and pitched that to the publisher and the publisher said, done, we want it. And then I started, you know, doing research. I must have read probably 20 books on resilience and rejection and all that. Uh, several articles from psychology journals. Then I said, this book, if I'm going to have 20 chapters, only four chapters will be about me. The balance 16 chapters will not have anything to do with me. Finally, the book has 60 different stories. Out mm. of that, about six or seven are from my life. Mm. The others are from outside. So I, I talk to people. I talk to 
senior bureaucrats i talk to olympic athletes i talk to startup entrepreneurs uh, i spoke with academicians i read up uh, interviews uh, articles about musicians about authors about film producers and the book slowly took shape and it you know we it was ready uh, actually in january or february and we would have launched it in may but because of the pandemic the launch got pushed to october so one one question i i feel that the moment you talked about rejection in those talks i think it brought out a different level of authenticity and vulnerability and probably that completely cuts across all all the you know barriers and goes across how how would you uh, you know empower oneself or others to be authentic and vulnerable in a in a situation it's a big question rohan i'm uh, it's a very big question uh, if you if you talk to any successful business leader the one thing which comes through is they are open they are transparent they are vulnerable they are ready to accept criticism they are humble in their own way and that's something which you learn by looking at all these people and i still remember i was getting out of fourth floor of bombay house where mr tata used to have his office i'd gone to meet mr goparkshan and i was coming out and uh, and from the lift mr tata came out and i i stood back he said no come you know and he opened the door for me i, I said no sir you know please he said no, 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 no. come 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 so then i walked out and then he opened the door for me and he and he walked you know he you know so that's a small thing it's not a big thing but you know it's a sign of the person mm. are you you know in my book other book i've written about some of these stories mm. uh, about the need for being authentic being an authentic leader is being open being transparent being ready to admit one's mistake and to know that you can be wrong you have to always know that you don't have all the answers that uh, you may be wrong you have to go with that little bit in the back of your head and I, and i when i coach people i say that so you got to have that openness the humility to say look i can be wrong it it you know when you're in a senior position it's very difficult to you know live that because people expect you to be knowing all the answers yeah to the masses you have to say that you have all the answers but you are in a core and which is why very important for every leader you got to have in a core mm. maybe three or four or five people and to those five people you got to be open you got to be transparent you got to be vulnerable you got to be ready to take criticism invite criticism in fact you know if you can't then you can't make a great leader the important thing is that you got to have a good set of four or five people around you and you got to encourage them to criticize you yes and and you got to be ready to take it Mm. so i think in in your book one of my one of my favorite topic was failure resume so obviously i don't want you to cover all the book here but you know few lines on that in fact i found it extremely useful for any person any leader of any age or even a fresher so that is a very practical doable idea maybe a little guidance uh, no fantastic you know i think you know i did, i stumbled upon it as i was doing my research for the book <coughs> discovered that uh, i think a phd scholar had mm. written uh, her her rejection resume she wrote about all the places where she had submitted a paper and she had failed you know rejected rejected, rejected. and that then became a kind of a uh, interesting phenomenon in the academic world mm. that you know there is no harm in accepting that i have been rejected many times mm. so it kind of triggered me and i have written about it in the book that and i give this advice to young people that you know when you go into an interview and i used to ask you know people who come you know i used to interview people i used to ask tell me about three of your successes and they say i did this it became a success and i did that and i saved so much money i did that great then i say look tell me about three of your failures and what have you learned from that and the guy starts mumbling something you know he, you know he or she will say well i have not really had any big failure in my life hello you know you know that's that's a patent lie so 
obviously this person is not perceptive enough so um, so in fact in the book i've put you know the last four page you know last section i've created a little exercise yeah. it makes sense for you to say look think back on your rejections maybe you got rejected from the school cricket team maybe you got rejected when you applied for some job maybe uh, you got rejected because your boss did not think you were good enough to be put in that special task okay. mm-hmm. yeah task force which is created to do something put that down and then think why were you rejected what is the reason for the rejection what can, what can you learn from that rejection and then how can you become better so in the book i have explained a, a simple three step formula for handling rejection first is to face rejection you know you got to be ready to face rejection you got to go boldly there i mean you got to have the confidence that i will win the business mm-hmm. but then you got to be ready that you will get rejected so that is one be ready to face rejection the second is once you hit by rejection start processing that rejection what happened what were the dynamics what was the body language what were the words which were said what was unsaid and what did role did you play and the third which is the most important part is what can you learn from that rejection so maybe you did not dress well for that role or you had not done enough preparation or maybe you did not have all the answers you not done enough homework so learn from the rejection so simple formula <clears throat> face process learn if you do that then reject you know you will still get rejected but with every rejection you will become that much better at what you do i i also noticed that you know while working with many leaders i have noticed that some the past rejection still haunts them you know childhood times and others and my sense is what you are suggesting can be also done with retrospective effect that i look at now and look at those four or five things that which always bug me whenever i think of them it you know explode something in me and do this or the or this whole philosophy of facing processing and learning even with retrospective effect and probably it can <clears throat> still have that power of bouncing back you can collect past rejections and and make a powerhouse of of spring in you now absolutely uh, absolutely you can think back and say you know you got rejected in something <laughs> what did you do wrong and what did you do right and how could you have done it better right and then tomorrow you can then if you face that tomorrow you'll be able to spring back and that was the idea of you know giving that in fact my literary agent and i had a big argument i said you know i want to give that little exercise the bob back he said no youngsters don't want to do those exercises i said no yaar you know i believe i should do it so i insisted and we put it there uh, and some people have commented saying yeah they found those last few pages useful you know it's been a learning experience i mean on when you i believe that if you were to write a book of 50000 words you probably need to read maybe 500000 words right to get that 50000 words and you will probably write 100000 words and cut out 50000 words get to 50000 words so uh, every book is a is great fun to do i enjoy i mean i did so much research to do write my book nawab nudes noodles just 50 years of indian advertising i had great fun you know researching it putting it together same thing with my book sponge which came out 2 years ago and same thing with spring which came out this year so every book is fun to do and uh, can say i am blessed that you know someone is ready to publish the book and uh, people are willing to buy the book and you know once in a while i get a nice message from someone thanking me for the book so while we are on this book topic i i think a whole lot of viewers watching you would also be budding authors who who have a book in them and for years the book is in them and it is not coming out so what would you what tip would you give to them you have written 10 books so how to deliver the book out rather than just carrying it forever so i think uh, you know chandramouli and i did an interview with anand rangaswamy <laughs> chandramouli passed away unfortunately earlier this year but you know Uh, mauli had this good point he said everyone has one book in him i know moha everyone right but we don't write it we spend our time talking about it you know i should write a book i should write a book you know and we never write it so i think the first thing is to start writing amit verma who has this fabulous uh, podcast called the scene and the unseen he also runs a writing workshop which i attended 
this earlier this year and he tells a simple thing he says you write every day start writing every day 100 words 200 words 300 words doesn't matter just write the process of writing every day will get you into the habit of you know putting things down so you may write 100 words one day and next day 200 next day 300 and you'll keep growing and then you know start writing after you got to about 10000 words you may say look this is not working i'll write something else then you start writing again so the only uh, way to get out of this inertia is to start writing so even in my own case you know every book takes 2 years i i kind of make some kind of a mental model of what the book is going to be and i start collecting like a like a crow building a nest i start collecting uh, bits and pieces and putting them into folders and then after 6 months i sit back look at those 10 folders i throw away four folders and i make the other six folders i make them into 10 again and then i start writing okay so this is a process i follow every author you know follows his or her own own process that's my process and when i once i've collected the material then I, you know it kind of flows but if you never written anything if you never written anything start reading first make it a habit to read <laughs> you know read every day spend an hour every day reading hmm. what about books which you like you know start reading and then start writing and then the book will come out you know magic <laughs> so uh, mb bot now you you have the 40 years of experience and having you know done a lot of courageous things handling rejections and many other things what are you looking forward to in life what from here on uh, ron i i you know unlike you i i was in corporate life till the age of whatever 60 and i've been doing my own coaching and consulting and teaching and mentoring and all that for the last 5 years thinking back i wonder maybe i should have started doing this like you you know when i was 55 you know i should cut out at 55 and started doing all these things because today i'm doing a lot of things i sit on boards i i i do executive coaching morning i had a had a wonderful uh, closing session with a very senior executive and i was touched because he said look we've been talking for the last year and a half and i think you know this these conversations have made a difference and and i was i was very happy to to hear that so going forward you know my like you my job is to help people and help entrepreneurs help business executives to perform uh, a little better in what they do so my focus area of course is branding and marketing so I, i try and stick to that and uh, i think there's so much entrepreneurial energy in this country uh, that you know all of them can do a little better marketing a little better branding you know we can be one of a 5 trillion or, or more as an economy because the whole process of marketing and branding improves the economic cycle a lot mm. of time people are scared you know people say are advertise karna is very expensive i said no do small stuff in your town in your district and then you take it and i give them the example of uh, some of the brands i worked with you know started with one state and then you get to the next state and the next state and the next state and you, know, you then become a national powerhouse brand so idea is to help help uh, entrepreneurs and companies to do better and if i achieve some level of success i'll be happy So, final question is: What advice would you give to a smart and driven leader, or a leader in making? I think every leader's leader has to, you know, dream. You got to dream of a future which may appear unachievable. Right, that's mm-hmm. the purpose of a leader. And then, of course, you need to build a core team which is ready to work with you on that dream. And then the dream will happen. maybe it will not happen in 5 years it may happen in 6 years or 7 years but it will happen you got to have that inner conviction to to do that and i and you'll do it so thank you very much mb for your time as well as the nuggets and the events and the stories and uh, i'm kind of going to become one uh, one person who will push your book to lot of people because last 5 6 days i have read it and it had made a huge difference in my own life 
and uh, in these two three days also i have you know made some difference in some people life who were you know struggling with rejection so thank you very much for uh, for the for who you are for actually being able to bring out what you have in words and in terms of tools because otherwise otherwise it might just get carried with you no thank you uh, thank you ron for having me on your on your show it was a uh... delightful speaking with you thank you for your kind words and uh, wish you and wish all the viewers all the very best in their in, in dreaming big and in achieving their dreams so thank you very much